Sea Cadet, um, National U.S. Naval Sea Cadet Headquarters Directors. And again, I just want to thank you, thank you for joining us today to come and hear about the U.S. Coast Guard Academy and the U.S. Coast Guard. We have a couple of special guests today. We actually have Captain Mike Freedy, and he is the Director of Admissions at the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. We have Lieutenant J.G. Laura Garofalo. She's a former admissions officer from the Coast Guard Academy, and she's currently the diversity and outreach officer there. And she's actually also one of our Sea Cadet officers. So we're very lucky to have her on board. And then we have another special guest today. Uh, he is a member of the US Coast Guard Academy class of 21. He's first class cadet Eric Bertolitis. And he is actually a former Sea Cadet chief petty officer with Viking Division. So we're very excited to have him on the call today to, to tell us about his experience at, uh, at the Coast Guard Academy. So without further ado, I am going to turn this over to Lieutenant Garofalo, who is going to make the formal introductions. And, uh, and I am excited to hear this presentation from Captain Freedy. And thanks again for joining us. Laura? Thank you, Ms. Powell. Hello, cadets. I'm Lieutenant JG Laura Garofalo. As Ms. Powell said, um, I actually work for Captain Freedy. Uh, for admissions. I've been there for about two and a half years, so I'm very excited that we have this opportunity, and you are so fortunate that you uh, have the opportunity to learn from Captain Freedy himself, which is awesome. Uh, I see a couple of you who have already gotten a presentation from Captain Freedy, so bravo Zulu to you for coming on again, so you get to hear even more of his awesome stories. And uh, so without further ado, Captain, if you're ready, Captain Mike Freedy, class of 1996 and Director of Admissions at the Coast Guard Academy. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Vicki. I really appreciate this opportunity to be with all of you. It's a special opportunity to be able to talk to uh, young folks that are looking for service in their future. And everybody's looking very sharp. So well done and getting ready for the uniform inspection. Uh, you pass your inspection if I'm the person that's giving you the inspection. So as I'm looking at each of the squares, you look all very sharp. So well done. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to Lieutenant Junior Grade Garofalo. This week was a pretty special week. We found out that she was selected for a lieutenant. So she'll be putting on lieutenant in probably about a year, but she was selected. So she's done amazing work for us in admissions and uh, is doing amazing work with you. So I really wanted to give her a shout out because uh, we are a, a lot better as a result of her hard work and effort. And I can see her leadership in all of you. So uh, well done, Laura. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to talk to everybody today on behalf of the Coast Guard Academy and uh, representing uh, Lieutenant Select Garofalo in that respect. So um, just a little bit about myself. I grew up in uh, Hingham, Massachusetts, which is just south of Boston. Anybody that knows New England and the Boston area uh, knows it's a pretty tight area uh, with regards to community life and uh, being by the water. So I've always been interested in the water, always been interested in military service. And uh, growing up, uh, it was really a focus of mine to get into a service academy for whatever reason. Although my grades weren't that great, I was what was considered a late bloomer. I uh, figured out how to study a little bit later than I should have. And uh, I had quite a, quite a climb to get to the Coast Guard Academy eventually, but I focused really on the Coast Guard uh, because I understood what the missions were. And I wanna introduce you to some of those missions and some of those resources, because in order to make that decision about the Coast Guard Academy, you really have to have a loving for the Coast Guard. And so hopefully I can help build that love for the Coast Guard in addition to what uh, Lieutenant uh, Junior Grade Garofalo has done. So. Um, I'm really excited uh, to be at the Coast Guard Academy as a director of admissions, because as a graduate, uh, you tend to appreciate the place after you depart. <laughs> but uh, I have always wanted to get back to the Coast Guard Academy uh, because it's a very special place. It is a special place because it's a small institution. It's a uh, very close knit and uh, the Coast Guard as a service is tremendous as a whole. In your four years at the Coast Guard Academy, develop you into a leader of character prepared to lead inside the Coast Guard. So uh, having that opportunity after departing the Coast Guard Academy and getting out there as a commissioned officer, it really, all the pieces of the puzzle came together. 
you know, the time management skills, uh, all the discipline that goes into uh, day in and day out life, it all amounted to an amazing experience and being prepared to lead others and being part of a team when you're out there in the fleet. So I wanna talk about the Coast Guard first, and then we can talk about the Coast Guard Academy and specifics about the Coast Guard Academy. And then I'm looking forward to answering your questions. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen because I put together a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation. Hopefully it comes through and hopefully it helps build your understanding specifically of the afloat community, which is really the foundation of what the Coast Guard is. So let's see here. If I don't mess this up, then we're good. All right. Laura, can you see uh, a pretty active screen for the Coast Guard? Yes, sir. All right, fantastic. Well, good. I, I passed step two of this process. After my introduction, I actually patched in on the, on the presentation. But what you see here is a pretty active screen of uh, Coast Guard personnel uh, doing the mission. And so we talk about the Coast Guard. Let's see. Oop. There we go. All right, when we talk about the Coast Guard, we're one of the five uh, branches of the US Armed Forces. Obviously we have the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, and the Marine Corps. Uh, those are part of the Department of Defense. Uh, we are part of the Department of Homeland Security. When we talk about the network, it, it's not about competing against each other. It's about building a system where we're able to work together and carry out uh, the defense of this nation, whether it's abroad or at home. And the Coast Guard is really the, the main arm, the main armed force, which focuses on the homeland. And um, I, something that we can all be congratulatory of is just how strong our military services are. We have the world's best Navy, the world's best Army, the world's best Air Force, the world's best Marine Corps. And with that, we have the world's best Coast Guard as well. We all take pride in what we do. We all take pride in what our responsibilities are. And in some cases, we work together in order to carry out those mission sets. So uh, as we swing into more knowledge about the Coast Guard, you'll understand how we fit into that network. So as I said, we're part of the Department of Homeland Security, which uh, makes us very unique, not part of the Department of Defense. And being part of the Department of Homeland Security, we have different types of mission sets. And one of those mission sets is really the law enforcement capability that we have, which makes us unique from all the other armed forces branches. Uh, the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps do not have a law enforcement capability to carry out uh, the law enforcement functions for the United States. The Coast Guard is the only service that is able to do that. So that's what makes us very different. Uh, although we have the majority of our mission sets around the United States the territories, we also are overseas doing many missions in foreign countries. And uh, that's something that's unique. Uh, understanding that 70% of the world is covered by ocean, uh, it's important that we have a strong naval force to, in order to do the missions that are expected to keep our homeland secure. So that's why the Coast Guard has contributed in terms of resources, a significant number of, of ships in order to carry out the Homeland Security mission at sea. So as I talked about, we are the world's best Coast Guard. Uh, and the reason why I say that is that when you look at all the other Coast Guards around the world, the countries have developed Coast Guard mission sets modeled after the United States Coast Guard, just based off of our tradition of excellence in terms of search and rescue, in terms of uh, the life-saving capability, in terms of all the missions that we do. They want to know how we do our business and they model themselves after the United States Coast Guard. One indicator of that is if you ever see a foreign Coast Guard vessel, it typically has a, a stripe on the side, a racing stripe similar to ours, orange and blue. So uh, that's pretty interesting to see, uh, understanding that they are modeling themselves after the United States Coast Guard. So when you're asking yourself about the missions that the Coast Guard has, uh, we'll break it down into some simple mission sets. Maritime safety, which is basically ensuring that uh, folks are safe and secure at sea through various uh, steps that they have to take. Meaning uh, safety equipment, 
as well as uh, following certain regulations in, in that type of aspect of the mission. And then maritime security. Maritime security uh, goes hand in hand with the Homeland Security uh, Department. So when you talk about maritime security, making sure that our waterways are secure, making sure that we have uh, a system where we're able to shut down certain areas if there's a threat out there. Mobility focuses on making sure that uh, national and international commerce can continue. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, ships can go in and out of port safely uh, with aids to navigation through the polar regions in terms of ice will form in colder regions. So we have to make sure that we have uh, paths where those ships can go uh, in and out of port to be able to do what it is that they do. Environmental protection, you probably heard the most about uh, when you're talking about oil spills and uh, responses to things that could disrupt the environment as a whole. The Coast Guard has a huge mission set in prevention and making sure that we can respond or even prevent uh, disasters from happening by basic rules and regulations and laws that are enforced as well as uh, immediate response and having capabilities to respond to those oil spills. And then national defense, that, it's very important when you're talking about threats that are out there that could come from the waterborne domain. We have an ability to respond to that based off the equipment and resources that are out there. So uh, we have 11 specific missions in uh, search and rescue. You've probably heard the most about that. When the worst day at sea is probably the best day for Coast Guard operations. Typically when the weather is bad, uh, we have uh, ships that are in peril and they need our assistance. So the Coast Guard will go out and rescue those individuals at sea and make sure that they get back home safely in, in the best case scenario. Aids to navigation is uh, our buoy tending mission set where uh, not all waters are marked uh, you know, in, in a similar manner. We wanna make sure that ships can go in and out of port uh, without running aground. And, and that's a very important mission set that we're responsible for. Marine safety, we talked a little bit about that in our uh, maritime safety piece. Uh, law enforcement is a very important uh, mission set uh, for a number of different reasons. We wanna make sure that people are abiding by the laws uh, at sea and uh, in the harbors and waterways. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of laws on the books that uh, there has to be a group that goes out there to enforce those laws and that would be uh, the sea cops, that which are basically United States Coast Guard members, in addition to state and uh, customs and other uh, local resources, we have a further reach in terms of that law enforcement capability, but that's a very important mission. Defense readiness is uh, ensuring that our nuclear submarines as well as ships are secure when they transit. It's very vulnerable uh, to be able to, to transit from your port out to the high seas. So uh, we provide a defense readiness posture to ensure that those ships are protected in their uh, vulnerable, most vulnerable state of navigating in those limited restricted waters. Migrant interdiction is a very important mission as well. When you're talking about individuals that are leaving uh, their home country, for a better way of life in the United States or for whatever reason, they typically take to the seas in order to get into the United States. And it's typically illegally. They want to uh, cross the high seas in order to get to the shores of the United States. And we're there to intercept them because uh, we want number one, for them to be safe. And number two, we don't want them to break the laws of coming in uh, as migrants. Drug interdiction is another important mission set. And uh, I spent most of my career doing drug interdiction. Um, the, the, the drug runners wanna uh, transit on the high seas, multi-ton loads of cocaine and other narcotics. Uh, the best way to do it would be to use something like what you see on the right-hand side, upper right-hand side of the screen. Uh, that's a semi-submersible vessel, which is uh, outfitted specifically for smug smuggling multi-tons of cocaine or other drugs or even weapons of mass destruction from uh, so South American ports up to Central American, in some cases, across to Europe. And uh, we're out there patrolling, trying to interdict those so that they, they're not successful in their mission 
of reaching shoreline to put drugs on our streets. ICE operations, very important. I talked about that a little bit, uh, making sure that we can cut through ICE so that ships and commerce can get uh, to the ports of interest and deliver the things that they need to deliver. Living marine resources is becoming more and more an important mission set. Understanding, as I talked about, 70% of the Earth's, Earth uh, being covered by water. Um, we're going to the, the seas more and more now in order to feed the populations of, of people in various countries. So making sure that people are fishing correctly in the right zones, not overfishing, so that uh, future generations have fish so that they can consume and uh, survive. So a uh, very important mission set there. I already talked about marine and environmental protection, as well as ports and waterway security. These are all the missions that we do. 11 statutory missions that are run by the United States Coast Guard. And uh, we do a very good job of that every single day. And uh, some of the statistics in terms of an average day, on an average Coast Guard day, uh, we conduct 45 search and rescue cases. We save 10 lives on an average day. We save over $1.2 million in property. And that could be anything uh, from a, a, a boat that's owned by uh, husband and wife to other vessels out there that could be in peril. We're out there to, to protect that property. We seize uh, 874 pounds of cocaine and 214 pounds of marijuana at, on average. But some days that's a lot higher. Uh, so it's pretty amazing to see how much we actually seize on the high seas, uh, usually in international waters closer to South American, Central American ports. We conduct 57 waterborne patrols of critical maritime infrastructure. Your question might be, hey, what is that? Well, uh, a major port would be a critical maritime infrastructure. Uh, an oil rig, offshore oil rig would be a, a critical maritime infrastructure. We introduce, interdict about 17 illegal migrants on an average day. And then you can see some of the other statistics there. Uh, buoy tending, we service 82 buoys and fixed aids to navigation every single day. Uh, this is pretty remarkable to see these statistics, understanding uh, our service is just a little bit larger than the U New York City Police Department with about 55,000 personnel, which makes us the smallest uh, service within the armed forces by a whole lot. So when you're talking about what it is that we do every single day on all the different coasts that we have, and even overseas, it's a tremendous undertaking. And it really takes dedicated men and women to carry out the mission day in and day out uh, for us to be successful. So uh, in addition to our personnel, uh, that's very important. We also have some uh, very important uh, resources that we use in, in terms of uh, the boats to carry out the missions as well as cutters and uh, aircraft. So when I'm talking about the different waterborne crafts, uh, anything that's less than 65 feet in length is considered a small boat, okay? And then anything larger than 65 feet in length is considered a cutter. So that will become more important as uh, you hear more in, in this presentation. But the number that you wanna focus on is 65 feet. So there's a trivia answer for you. <laughs> if somebody asks you, hey, how, how large does a ship have to be in order to be a, considered a Coast Guard cutter? 65 feet is your answer. But focused on small boats. Small boats we have the most of, and they're at just about every single station or unit that the Coast Guard has because they carry out uh, close to shore operations on a daily basis. What you see here is that uh, security detail around a Navy ship as it's transiting out of port or into port. So we provide security to ensure that smaller vessels don't try to sneak in uh, and try to take out that larger vessel, Navy vessel. So it's a pretty important mission for us and we carry it out every single day. Those small boats also respond to offshore uh, search and rescue cases. We use those on a regular basis and uh, they're very successful, very capable of vessels. So small boats are in a very important part of our mission every single day. Uh, unfortunately, as an officer, you don't get much time on those. Uh, although those are the funnest jobs that uh, the Coast Guard has to offer, 
But when you're talking about the boat drivers and the engine maintainers and the, the weapon specialists that are on there, uh, they see action every single day, whether it's search and rescue or law enforcement or some other response. Uh, but those that predominantly a mission set for the enlisted members, but managed by officers, uh, if you're considering the Coast Guard Academy as an option. But those are small boats, pretty cool operations day in and day out. That's just one example of uh, a small boat. They come in many sizes. So you can see there on the side of the hull of the vessel, 25, uh, the first two numbers are typically the length of the vessel. And then the rest of it is the hull number. So uh, pretty cool stuff there. Okay. All right. The next mission set that we have is uh, the, the buoy tending, aids to navigation. So some more trivia for you. If it's a black hull on a ship, it means that it's a working vessel. And the reason why that is, is that they get close to those buoys. As you see down in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, uh, that's a buoy. It's very large, very heavy, and it bangs up against the ship. And if this was any other color than black, then you would see the damage that <laughs> could be done. Uh, but typically there's no damage because our buoy tender crews are very precise in what they do. Uh, but if it should hit the side of the boat, it would leave a, a paint mark at the very least. So the black hole kind of disguises that uh, to a certain extent. But this is one of our larger buoy tenders. They work every single day to make sure that ships can navigate safely and that lights are uh, maintained and that uh, we make sure that everybody, whether it's Coast Guard, Navy, or commercial vessels or uh, private craft, they're able to navigate into waterways safely and effectively. So very good mission set there. And then our icebreakers. So our polar icebreakers are actually our largest ships that we have, and they have uh, dual functions. Not only do they go up to break ice up in the polar regions, whether it's the Arctic or the Antarctic, but they also carry scientists on board. They carry scientists on board so they can do studies and they can determine whether or not global warming is something that's happening. They can track uh, icebergs. They can do a whole bunch of different things uh, from these platforms. Uh, they typically carry two helicopters and uh, they're all based out of Seattle. The United States Coast Guard is the only uh, service in the United States that, that maintains icebreakers. We also have one icebreaker on the Great Lakes. It's called the Mackinac and that's a pretty cool ship. Um, but overall, the red hull on the ship gives you the ability to see it from further distances than if it was any other color. So that's why it's painted red. And uh, we, right now we have uh, two in our inventory with more on the way. So we typically, typically we would have uh, three uh, of the polar breakers and then we have the Mackinac uh, on the Great Lakes. Uh, but one of the uh, polar icebreakers is down for maintenance. And I'm not sure if that's coming up, but the, most of these are gonna be replaced in the upcoming years. The next mission set and the type of Coast Guard cutter that I wanna talk about are our patrol boats. And uh, these are pretty awesome. When, when you're talking about the day in and day out opportunities for junior officers and enlisted members, uh, these are tight neck crews, uh, probably about, uh, the, the most you'll see is about 20 personnel on one of these ships but they go out every single day for shorter durations of time to carry out the missions that the Coast Guard has them to do. Uh, as you can see, they're painted white. Uh, white hulls focus on the law enforcement mission set. And so uh, in addition to the law enforcement uh, mission set, they, they'll do whatever mission is necessary in order to carry out uh, the Coast Guard's needs out there. So uh, highly capable, very fast. Uh, they can only go out for a short period of time if they work independently, but if they work with a mothership of some sort, they can go out for longer periods of time. But you'll see three different classes here. You see the fast response cutter FRC. That's one of the newest type of class, class of cutter. We're still building those and building our fleet significantly. And those are awesome ships. The 110 foot patrol craft that you see on the right hand side, that's a legacy vessel that's being phased out. We only have a few up in Alaska in, in limited places around the United States, but for the most part, in, in Pat Forsois as well, but for the most part, those are the workhorse of the Coast Guard for a number of years. Uh, so very capable platform and to do all the missions that we have here 
and uh, pretty awesome. And then the 87 foot patrol craft, uh, that's a smaller vessel, about 11 personnel on board, and they're able to carry out uh, shorter duration missions. And uh, pretty cool, we have one stationed at the United States Coast Guard Academy. So if you ever come to the Coast Guard Academy, you can check one out uh, and pretty awesome mission set. You can get command as a Lieutenant Junior Grade for 87 foot patrol craft. So uh, one thing about the Coast Guard is you get a lot of responsibility early on in your time in your career. So that's uh, something that's very different in, in comparison to other services. You will have can command of your own patrol craft if you desire and work hard for it, uh, that opportunity is there early in your career. <clears throat> I talked about the legacy fleet uh, with the 110 foot Coast Guard cutter being one of them. So that's on the right hand side. On the left hand side, you'll see the 210 foot Coast Guard cutter. And uh, I was on one of those as an operations officer, loved that vessel. Uh, it's, it was made in the 1960s, so it's even older than me. Although you all probably think I'm pretty old, well, that's a pretty old ship. So uh, we're, we're looking to replace those, uh, but highly capable vessel that can land a helicopter. So uh, you can have a helicopter on board and uh, carry out the mission with that helicopter capability. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see the 370 foot a 378 foot Coast Guard cutter. And uh, this is a high endurance cutter, meaning it can go out for multiple months at a time to carry out the mission and do amazing things for the service. I was first stationed on uh, that type of ship, uh, the Coast Guard cutter Mellon, based out of Seattle, Washington, where we did fisheries operations up in the Bering Sea, and we did counter drug operations off of South America and Central America. Highly capable platform that carries a helicopter, has a, a helo hangar uh, in there. So you can do many missions from that platform. Those are being phased out pretty significantly fast as we're replacing them with the next class of cutter, which is the National Security Cutter. So the National Security Cutter is very exciting. When you're talking about the mission that we have uh, in the defense of the United States, as well as working with the Navy and other services uh, to carry out whatever it is that the United States needs us to do. The National Security Cutter has been designed to do exactly that. It, it, it is awesome. So when you look at the size of the vessel, it's tremendously large and compares to littoral combat ship that the Navy has. In fact, this is the third platform of the littoral combat ships that the Navy has created for their mission sets. But this is, uh, duly selected uh, and specifically designed for the Coast Guard. When you talk about the law enforcement capability as well as the needs for uh, the, a platform to do multi-missions, this was specifically designed for our needs. If you look in the stern of this vessel, you can see uh, what looks like a ramp. Well, that's exactly what it is. There's three small boats that are in, in that vessel that can deploy so that we can carry out multiple uh, boarding operations on the high seas, intercept vessels, and uh, those, those small boats can work over the horizon and carry out the mission uh, independently of the Coast Guard cutter. But the National Security Cutter has uh, amazing cyber capabilities. They have an intel suite. They can have a law enforcement detachment uh, deployed on them. Uh, they can carry two helicopters, our uh, 65 Dolphin helicopter, it is an awesome platform. As you can see from the picture on the right-hand side, uh, one of the 65 helicopters is there. A small, highly capable helicopter to carry out the missions that we have, as well as the CASA, which is a, a um, patrol aircraft, as well as a cargo aircraft, which carries out the missions of search and rescue, as well as delivery of uh, goods to the various places. So awesome platform and it's the future of the Coast Guard. If you're looking to join the Coast Guard, absolutely, now is the best time to join because we are getting ships, uh, new ships almost every single uh, month, if not every single uh, year with regards to increasing our capabilities in, in the mission sets. And it's an exciting time to see the growth of our fleet and the modernization of our fleet. Just about every single Coast Guard Carter that you see will have a deck gun. 
which is very similar to the Navy. We won't have any type of harpoon missiles or anything like that, but we will have a deck gun and some machine guns on there uh, to carry out the defense operations that are expected of us. In time of war, the United States Coast Guard can fall under the United States Navy if necessary. So having the right capabilities to do that is very important. And this is one of those ships is that, that's gonna allow us to do that. And then very exciting, uh, the offshore patrol cutter. It's a little bit smaller than the national security cutter, but it will replace our uh, legacy fleet uh, with, when we're talking about the Reliance class cutter. And this has a helicopter hangar. It can land a helicopter and it will have all the capabilities that's necessary in order to do uh, medium endurance mission sets, as well as potentially high endurance mission sets, which would be uh, three month deployments, if not longer. So very exciting to see this new class of ship being put into our inventory. And in fact, uh, the, the government, US government has uh, designated a significant amount of funds in order to get these online and built so that we can modernize our fleet and carry out the mission in the future. All right, so that was just something to whet your appetite with regards to the mission. Uh, I know we have a, a lot to talk about in terms of the Coast Guard Academy, but I wanna answer your questions if you have any questions about the Coast Guard in general, and then I can talk about the Academy. Does anybody have any questions about the Coast Guard? Okay, Adam Alami, how are you? Let's see. How I'm do we good, get Captain Freedy, how are you? Very good, thank you, Adam. Thank you, sir. So my question is, are there any opportunities for commissioned officers to join Coast Guard Special Forces or Coast Guard Special Operations? Yes, excellent question. So um, we have something called the Deployable Specialized Forces within the Coast Guard. Uh, under the Deployable Specialized Forces, we have the tactical law enforcement teams, we have the maritime safety and security teams, and we have uh, the counterterrorism team, which is the MSRT. Uh, we also have port security units. Uh, we have a national strike force, and those all fall under our deployable specialized forces. I spent the majority of my career in the tactical law enforcement world, which is similar to the Coast Guard's version of a SWAT team. Uh, we have the ability to uh, go out at any time, deploy with US Navy or US foreign warships and do boarding operations on the high seas, looking for whatever it is that are out there. The tactical law enforcement teams are seen as the maritime professional boarding teams with the, throughout the United States. Uh, we are professional boarding officers, boarding team members that carry out high risk uh, intercepts as well as high risk boardings. So pretty, pretty great opportunity for you. Uh, typically, if you go to the Coast Guard Academy, it will be your second tour. Uh, you will put in for your second tour. I, was, I had the privilege of doing four tours at a tactical law enforcement team. I started out as a deployable team leader, and then I went to uh, the deployable pursuit boat, which we had specialized boats uh, assigned to the, to the tacklet. And then I was able to go as the executive officer of tacklet South, and then finally as a commanding officer of tacklet South. Uh, great communities. There's only two tacklets in the United States Coast Guard's inventory. One is based in Miami, the other is, is based in San Diego. So those are good ports of duty. So that's pretty cool. I talked about the maritime safety and security teams. Those uh, units have uh, no law enforcement capability, uh, but they do have fast boats and they have the ability to do uh, defense operations and they can join with other uh, tactical law enforcement teams or the MSRT in order to get that law enforcement capability. So pretty awesome small boat opportunities. Typically you'd see yourself going there as a second tour. And then uh, the MSRT is our counterterrorism unit. And those are those guys are probably the highest trained and the best uh, in the world of work that they do. And there's two units uh, for the maritime uh, MSRT. One is in San Diego, another is in Chesapeake, Virginia, and they are pretty awesome. You don't hear much about what they do because uh, it, it's all 
under wraps, but they do a heck of a lot for the country and uh, pretty exciting stuff. So those are mission sets that you can join as a commissioned officer and uh, continue to progress in your career. So thank you, Adam, for that question. Any other questions? It looks like uh, Ducey Thomas at around what rank does an officer transition over to a desk job? Okay, <laughs> good question. <laughs> so uh, there's operational opportunities in all various ranks. I think uh, when you're pure desk job, it's at the flag rank because as a 06 like me, uh, you can go back afloat. Uh, if, you've get, if you've built a career in the afloat community and drove and commanded cutters, you can continue to do that. Uh, the, the desk jobs are really wherever it fits into your career set. Uh, some of the officers that we have will go and become professionally educated and that's what they focus on. They want to focus on uh, doing uh, naval architecture, marine engineering, or civil, uh, civil engineering, or become lawyers or finance specialists. That's what they track in their whole career as. Uh, there's other operational assignments that are out there that you can stay operational with our sectors, which is a shore-based uh, operational assignment. Uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of variety there. So it really comes down to what you want to do in your career but you have to build upon that experience in order to earn those higher opportunities as you climb in the ranks. So hopefully that answers your question. Great question though. All right, let's see. Who else? Thank you, Laura, for putting out the, the guidelines with uh, regards Captain, to the questions. Yes. Uh, Jennifer Nandor, I believe raised her hand as well. Okay. Jennifer, how are you? Um, sir, it's actually Lucy. It won't let me change my name. Okay. Hi, Lucy. Hi. Um, out of all the missions that you guys can do in the Coast Guard, what do you say is the best one to be on? Excellent question. So for me, <laughs> I, I think that anything law enforcement focus is pretty awesome. But there are folks that believe that um, responding to oil spills is the most exciting mission set for them. And that's awesome. You know, we got to do have people that want to do that. There are other folks that think that uh, the mission set of, uh, you know, doing the things day in and day out to make our financial, uh, make us operationally capable through finances. That's what they see is important. The one thing I want to impress upon you is with the Coast Guard, you can choose whatever path that you want to go. And uh, going to the Coast Guard Academy will help develop your idea of what path that you want to go to. But there's always an operational opportunity for you. So regardless of what operational mission set that you direct yourself to, you're going to be doing every single mission that the Coast Guard has out there. So you might be stationed on a Coast Guard cutter, but one minute you might be performing a search and rescue case. Next minute you might be performing a law enforcement operation. So just keep that in mind that you are a master of just about every single mission set that's out there because we practice it every single day and it's something that we, we carry out. So um, you'll get a good understanding of what you feel it best matches what your skill sets and what makes your heart pump fast. Uh, and you can track on that in your career, but it really, it, it, the Coast Guard is, is boundless with regards to the opportunities when you're talking about operational skill set. Great question, thank you. Elijah Hampton. How are you? I think you're on mute. How are you? Doing well. Um, when should you sign up if that is what your goal is after high school? Perfect. All right, this is good segue into the Coast Guard Academy discussion. Uh, so if you're looking to become a commissioned officer in the Coast Guard and uh, you've heard about the Coast Guard Academy or haven't heard about the Coast Guard Academy, uh, in your junior year of high school, you should really start solidifying your idea of what you, you wanna do uh, in your college career. If you're looking at a service academy, junior year is when you wanna start looking seriously and start visiting schools 
and start talking to admissions officers. I would say even earlier than that, but uh, junior year is where you have the opportunity to apply to go to a summer program. And uh, for the Coast Guard Academy, it's our AIM program, which is the Academy Introduction Mission. And that's uh, during your rising junior to your senior year, you're able to come to the Coast Guard Academy and see what it is to be a swab for a week. And uh, a swab is the new person showing up at the Coast Guard Academy and uh, learn about the Coast Guard Academy, learn about uh, all it, it takes to have those foundational pieces come into play. Uh, during your junior year, you also develop a good relationship with your admissions officer. Uh, Lieutenant Junior Grade Garofalo is one of my best admissions officers by far, and she's done an amazing job. So uh, she will answer questions, help you through the application process, give you guidance, and keep you on track for meeting those deadlines. So uh, we have a website that I hope that you check out, and that will give you some additional information. Uh, take this down. I, I'm sorry I don't have a slide for it, but it's www.uscga.edu, and that will answer a lot of your questions. If you're not a junior, if you're earlier than that, that's great. We want you to understand about the Coast Guard Academy, understand about the Coast Guard as soon as possible. But your junior year, you need to start formulating your plan in terms of how to uh, finish applications, try to get to the summer program, and work toward finalizing your decision. The Coast Guard Academy is a great institution. I think it's one of the ways that you can become an officer. But if you're not ready to make that decision of whether or not to go to the Coast Guard Academy, you can go to a traditional college and track in an academic major and then apply to go to officer candidate school. Officer candidate school requires you to have a bachelor's degree and then you can go and apply to officer candidate school and become a commissioned officer that way. So you can have a traditional college life and then apply for a an opportunity to become a commissioned officer through officer candidate school. And that's another great way in order to become a commissioned officer. So for the Coast Guard, it's about 50% of our Officer Corps come from the Academy, 50% of the Officer Corps comes from the Officer Candidate School route. And there's programs all throughout uh, that will get you directed to Officer Candidate School, but that's kind of the, the basic understanding of uh, that decision-making criteria that you have to make. Does that help you, Elijah? All right. Thumbs up from Elijah, thank you. <laughs> Other questions? No problem, Elijah. I saw something from Joseph. Joseph uh, Berthissel. Sir, if you were enlisted, what would it mean if you applied to the academy? All right, great question, Joseph. Uh, so we have another number of enlisted members, whether they're from other services, but they majority, the majority of them come from the Coast Guard that apply to the Coast Guard Academy. And uh, we're excited to see those because we know that an individual that has served in the Coast Guard understands what they're asking when they sign up uh, for an opportunity to be appointed to the Coast Guard Academy. Some of our best officers have an enlisted roots. And uh, they, they, they understand the service better than anybody and can bring truth to power in many of those discussions. So we, we are excited when we see those applications. So an enlisted member can apply, but they have to apply and be here for reporting in before their 23rd birthday, okay? So there's a small window of opportunity in order for you to apply for the Coast Guard Academy. Now, the enlisted members that apply to Officer Candidate School, I think they have up until the age of 27 to apply. So that's a little more time uh, for you to get some good background with inside the Coast Guard, make those decisions that you have to make. And then by the age of 27, you have to report uh, to uh, Officer Candidate School to become a commissioned officer. And then there's some waivers and some other programs that you can uh, enter in at a little bit older because we like that experience too. So that's another great way to become a commissioned officer if you're uh, in the enlisted ranks. Thank you. What opportunities would I have? The ultimate goal would be a medical officer. Okay, so great question. We always get that question. Um, right now, uh, as it stands, the United States Coast Guard, because of how small it is, we do not have a medical track 
at, through the academy. We do not have a medical officer corps with inside the Coast Guard. We rely on the US Public Health Service in order to get our medical uh, professionals. Uh, in terms of dentists and doctors, they come from US Public Health Service. Within the last couple of years, the Coast Guard is trying to grow their physician's assistant. Uh, so that's another path that you can go. You can go to the United States Coast Guard, serve your first tour and whatever track that you go. And then you can apply to become a, a PA, physician assistant. And that's the closest that we can get uh, in terms of doctor you know, in that direction. But a, a PA is really the person that does all the background work prior to the doctor coming into the room and doing what they have to do. So it's a good foundation for you. If you wanna take uh, time later to get education, to become a doctor, that opportunity is there for you. But we don't have a medical uh, track within the Coast Guard Academy. Uh, it's important to understand that. Uh, but it shouldn't dissuade you from, <laughs> from wanting to come to the Coast Guard Academy because we have many of the graduates after they do their five-year commitment, they'll go off and uh, they'll work toward their medical degree. So that's something else that I want to pass on to you. When you're talking about the Coast Guard Academy, some of the reasons why you'd want to come to the Coast Guard Academy, well, it's for free, similar to the other service academies. Uh, there is a five-year uh, return on investment uh, tour uh, requirement that you have. So you'll probably get about four assignments out during that time, uh, five years, uh, but that's how you pay your time back at the academy because uh, you, you do get a free education, but you get paid while you're at school. And the other thing that's cool is that we guarantee you a job for five years. So <laughs> if you go to college on your own, uh, it's, it's very rare that there's immediate job placement, but we have a job for you immediately. And we want to see that leadership in character in action. And we'll put you in a position of leadership. You're able to carry out the mission set as a team member, as well as a leader. And uh, everything comes together when, when all is said and done. So that's a good thing. Some other reasons why you'd want to come to the academy. We have 103 acres of uh, territory on campus. So it's a small campus. Our class sizes are about 250 students. In comparison to the other, the big three, uh, Navy, Air Force, and uh, Army, their, their service academies have about 1,500 students per class. So that's a pretty large uh, difference in terms of uh, class sizes. Total student population at the Coast Guard Academy with all four classes on board is 1,000 students. So why is that important? Well, you'll know everybody in your class by name. Uh, by you will know them. There's no doubt about it. Not only that, you'll know the top three uh, grades above you and the bottom three grades below you by name as well. Uh, so that's important because once you go out into the fleet, you'll actually have a couch to sleep on if you go into a port and uh, you're looking to, to hang out with folks. You'll know somebody in that port. So that's good in, in terms of the mission set and being a close knit community. Uh, I've heard stories where Students have gone to the Naval Academy and uh, they're from the same state, they're in the same class, and then they'll go to the first duty assignment and never have met each other, just based off of how large those school, that school is. But that might be something that you like too. It really comes down to what works for you. We have a one to eight uh, teacher to student ratio in the classrooms. You won't see a classroom that's more than 18 students at any given time. Uh, some other things that are important for you to know, uh, we have nine academic majors, mainly focused on STEM. Uh, we have five engineering focused majors, and then we have uh, government management, and operations research, and marine environmental science. So uh, that's important to understand the difference between our academic majors versus the other service academies. The other service academies have 25 different offerings. We have nine. And the reason why we only have nine is because those are what our service really depends upon when all is said and done. So those are some of the reasons why you should consider the Coast Guard Academy. I, I think seeing it for yourself is really where you're going to get that feeling whether or not this is a place for you. All right. What other questions do we have out there? Uh, Captain? Yes. 
we're going to go with one more question and then we're going to uh, switch over so that we can have first class Bertolaitis speak as well, sir, if that's okay yes. with you. I, I agree with that. I, I think that's a good plan. He can definitely bring truth to power. Thank and you, I sir. appreciate him being here. So uh, we should just skip to him. He, he's the more exciting person for sure. <laughs> Uh, okay. Did you have any more questions in your chat, sir, that maybe didn't get answered from anyone? We sure, can do one see. more. Sir, where is the Academy and what aircraft does the Coast Guard fly? Excellent question. I apologize if I didn't state that early on. We are located in New London, Connecticut, which is about two hours south of Boston, two and a half hours north of New York City. We're on the coast. Uh, Mystic, Connecticut is probably the, the most popular, well-known uh, location. New London, Connecticut is where we're at. We're located on the Thames River. Right across the way from us is the Groton Subbase. So if anybody knows uh, what the Nautilus is, uh, the, the Navy uh, sub, the first nuclear sub, that's we can look at the Nautilus across from where we're at because uh, they're across the river. Um, the type of aircraft that we have, we have a uh, very limited aircraft, but it's very important that we keep it to a small number. We don't have jets. We have uh, propellered aircraft, uh, cargo plane C-130, as well, well as the C-144. And then we have the, uh, the Spartan as well. So those are good uh, multi-capable aircraft that are able to do uh, amazing work for us in search and rescue, as well as delivering of goods. And then we also have two types of air, two types of helicopters. I talked about the Dolphin. That's uh, that's ship based. It's smaller and it's uh, very fast and capable. And then we also have uh, the HH60 Jayhawk, which is the equivalent of the Seahawk. So pretty awesome helicopter, big iron as uh, those pilots talk about, and they can go out for six hours at a time. Very capable search and rescue. Uh, platform as well as multi-mission. And uh, those are the aircraft that we fly in the Coast Guard. So uh, if you're a pilot, you get a lot of stick time, uh, regardless of what rank that you are. And uh, that, that's very important. We do not have any V-22 Osprey, but I hope that we get those, Elijah. Uh, that's hopefully something that we get into the inventory that that would be a dream come true for me because I think those aircraft are pretty cool. But um, we don't have them as they stand right now. Great question. So uh, we got a first class cadet who is really the star of the show because he's living a cadet life right now as it stands. And he's been there for up almost four years now, almost ready to go out into the fleet. He has prepared himself to be a fleet ready ensign. And uh, we really want to hear from him because he can bring truth to power about what uh, the Coast Guard Academy is and what the Coast Guard is in his mind. So uh, without further ado, I will turn it back over to you, Laura. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody. Thank you for your excellent questions and uh, I will stop talking. Thank you so much, Captain. We appreciate your time. And if any of you cadets still have questions for Captain Freedy, uh, please send them to me or if Captain is okay with it, if you're still on, sir, they could still ask you. But Sure. Um, otherwise, send them to me if if captain's not on and I will answer them or get them answered for you. And without further ado, Mr. Bertolatus, could you please come on? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. And I can see you. Great. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, as it's been mentioned, I'm first class Eric Bertolatus. I am a first class at the academy, um, which at other schools is what you would call a senior. Um, I've been here for about three and a half years. Um, as I think was mentioned at the, the top of this, I was a Sea Cadet before I came to the Coast Guard Academy. I joined Sea Cadets when I was 13 years old. Um, and it's really uh, how I became introduced to the Coast Guard. I kind of always wanted to be in the Marine Corps. My dad was in the Marines um, until I staffed some recruit trainings at Cape May, which um, for those of you that may know, but probably don't, the Cape May is where the Coast Guard does recruit training for the enlisted force. And so it was kind of my first exposure ever to the Coast Guard and I kind of saw it and was like, well, what is this? And then I found out through also Sea Cadets that I could go do an advanced training for a week at a Coast Guard station and it was a locally arranged training. 
And so I went down to Coast Guard um, small boat station Annapolis for a week and kind of learned a little bit more about what the Coast Guard was. And from there, I became really interested in the Coast Guard. Um, so after I had had all my great experiences that I had in Sea Cadets, um, I applied to the Coast Guard Academy, the Naval Academy, and Marine Corps ROTC, and I actually wasn't accepted to any of the three of them. Um, so I went to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and participated in ROTC without a scholarship um, and reapplied to all three. And I was accepted to the Coast Guard Academy, which was definitely my first choice of service after um, I kind of got that um, that week of experience of what the Coast Guard was. And um, I think one thing that people, for people who are kind of thinking like, maybe the Coast Guard's for me, maybe it's not for me, or maybe the Coast Guard Academy is for me, um, that I think is a great thing that I can put in right there is when you're trying to decide um, maybe what branch you want to join or um, what, if you'd like to go to the Naval Academy or West Point or the Coast Guard Academy, um, think about what comes after the Academy um, and all those missions that Captain Freedy talked about. Um, don't just think about the Academy itself. Um, so when I got here, um, again, did one year, reapplied, got here. Um, I study Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering, which is a really unique, um, it's a really unique program. Not that many schools have it. The, the Coast Guard Academy, the Naval Academy, and the University of Michigan are the only ones that I know of that offer that major um, inside the United States. If it's something that you think you're interested in, um, I think we're one of the best places to do it because not only are we learning how to design ships and things like that, we're also going out and being on ships and learning how ships work hands-on in a practical sense. Um, we get to do that, that each summer um, that we're here. So that's awesome as well. Um, I am graduating hopefully at the end of this year. Um, I'm hoping for naval flight training um, or student engineer on a ship. Um, so when you go to a ship, you can either be a student engineer, which is working in the engine room um, on the engines and machinery equipment, or you can be a deck watch officer, which is navigating and steering the ship. Um, and so just a few things about, I guess, my view on I think we lost him. Stand by, cadets. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry about that, everyone. I'm running off of a phone hotspot right now. Um, so uh, where was I? Um, a few things about, I guess, my advice to people who are looking to get into the, the Coast Guard Academy, um, definitely from an academic standpoint, um, keep your grades high um, and push yourself in classes. Um, don't take easy classes or um, you know, try to avoid the, the senioritis or, or everything like that. Um, get involved with um, physics, calculus, uh, chemistry, do things that you're gonna enjoy too because you'll do better in classes that you enjoy. Um, than you will in just doing things because you think it's going to look good. But um, everybody here is required to pass Calculus 1. Um, a lot of people are required to pass Calculus 2. Um, and everybody has to pass Physics 1, Chemistry 1. And I believe unless the um, curriculum has changed since I went through it, at least either Physics 1, or I'm sorry, either Physics 2 or Chemistry 2. Um, so even if you're a government major, or management major, which is not traditionally STEM majors. Um, everybody here does have to pass those. Um, so that would be my advice academically. Um, athletically, I think a common misconception is that to go to an academy, you have to be like a varsity athlete or you have to play some type of organized sport. Um, that's not necessarily true. There's people who do other things here and that's fine too. Um, but everybody does have to be in good shape um, physically to, to be able to commission as an officer. And so when you hear people talk about athletics at the academy, um, it's really about um, just being in good shape, good physical shape, go out, work out, run, um, do push-ups, the same things you guys would do um, if you were training for your, your Sea Cadets PRT, honestly. Um, and that'll help you if you're a swab summer. There's going to be a lot of um, physical training, so it'll help you for that. 
and then leadership i think is the third the third key part um get involved in whatever you like to get involved in it doesn't really matter too much what i don't think um whether that's your church or sea cadets obviously that's a that's a great start um on a sports team leading that as a captain however however you like to lead or get involved in your community that's a great way to do it um, and I think my, my other piece of advice there would be, and somebody put this to me a while back like this, would be to cast your net deep, not wide, meaning it's a lot better to be, in my opinion, again, um, really involved in one or two things than it is to be involved just on the surface in six or seven different things, just to say, oh, I'm a Boy Scout, but you don't really do anything in Boy Scouts or, oh, I... Um, you know, anything like that. So um, that's kind of my advice. If you guys have any questions about um, what it's like to live here as a cadet, um, especially, you know, if you're maybe not sure that the academy is for you, um, regular college versus being a cadet, I can definitely speak to that too. Um, yeah, thank you guys. Thanks so much, first class Bertolatus. Appreciate that. Appreciate your time um, and your hotspot. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Bertolatus? You could try to send them in the chat to him or you can send them to me and I will read them to him. I just got one, ma'am. Um, it was from Adam Malami. Um, from your cadre training in Cape May, what would you say is the biggest difference between Swab Summer and Cape May Boot Camp? Um, and so what he's referencing for you guys that don't know, um, when we're second class, so when we just finished our sophomore year, we are cadre for that next summer. And cadre, basically their job is to train the incoming Swabs, the incoming fourth class. Um, and starting with my cadre class, um, they didn't do it this year for COVID reasons, but starting with my cadre class, we um, traveled down to Cape May, where, like I mentioned, is where um, the uh, Coast Guard does their enlisted recruit training. Um, and we spent, for my class, it was 24 hours there with the company commanders, um, kind of like for the first, from about 6 p.m. until 8 the next morning, um, they treated us just like recruits, basically. Um, so we kind of got that perspective. And then starting around 8 o'clock, they started um, training us a little bit more of like, this is how we teach the recruits things. And this is how we show the recruits to do things. And so to answer the question, um, that was a great experience. I think one of the biggest things in my view, one of the biggest differences is, um, and again, this is based on 24 hours of experience. So I, I'm definitely not the most qualified person to answer this, but I think, um, recruit training tends to be a lot more about you get an order you listen to the order and you follow that order, um, period, that's it. I think Swab Summer and probably almost any other officer training program that you could go through, whether it's officer candidate school, um, any other academy or any other officer candidate school for any other branches, you're cultivating like, you want people who are going to think critically about things um, and come up with how to give those orders and, um, not just respond and then do, I guess, if that makes sense to people. Um, does that answer the question kind of? They can't unmute themselves. So oh. that, was a, that was a good answer. And I think that's that was a great way to put it, Eric. Um, I went through Cape May and I went through Reserve Officer Candidate School and that was a really good way to put it. You're kind of just following directions at Cape May for the enlistment side of things. They teach you how to be a leader as well, but the leadership and being part of a team really comes to fruition when you come to the academy for an officer session program, or I think at Swap Summer too, or learning to work together. So great answer. You have a couple more questions that they've sent to me. What does it look like day to day at the academy? So the day to day, um... It changed a lot this year, actually. Um, there was some new command combined with COVID. Um, now, it used to be we would wake up every morning at 0620 in the morning, and then we'd have a formation, and then uh, what they call family-style breakfast. So we would all go down 
to the same cafeteria, all 1,000 or so cadets in the Corps, and we would all eat breakfast together. Um, now that's changed. Um, we basically just have to be ready to go for the workday and have our doors open. By 0745 in the morning, breakfast is optional. Um, and then all day from 0745 to 1600, um, it's considered the work day. So that's, um, if you have class, obviously you go to class. Um, but your company officer and company chief who, um, I guess basically to sum them up quickly can kind of be looked at as mentors um, are in the, they work in Chase Hall where we live. Um, so you can go talk to them, take care of business that you need to take care of with them if you need to. If you don't have class, you can, if you don't have class and you don't have any other military responsibilities to do, um, you can go work out or you can do your homework. Um, sometimes there are military responsibilities to do. So sometimes you'll have duty, um, which as a, as a freshman, as a fourth class, that's usually you have duty once or twice a week, but only for a couple hours at a time. And then by the time you're a, a first class, you have it probably, I don't know, three or four times a semester, but when you have it, you have it all day long. Um, so if you have duty, you have to stay on duty. Um, but really like during that work day, I would say it's honestly mostly just like going to regular college, except you're in a uniform. Um, after that work day at 1600 is when sports period begins. That's when most sports teams um, practice um, from 1600 to 1800. Um, I play ice hockey, which we actually practice over at Connecticut College, which we normally practice from 4.30 in the morning till about 0600. So it's a little bit different for me. Um, but if you don't play a sport or you play a sport that's out of season, so um, like the football players in the spring don't have a sports period, um, then it's again, free time. You can do homework, you can go to the gym, you can do whatever you'd like to do. Um, and then for the rest of the night after 1800, um, you have dinner and it's basically just academic study time, um, whatever else you need to do. Um, I'd say that's a pretty typical day, Saturdays and Sundays. Um, sometimes there's military training um, on Saturday mornings. Oh, that's another thing. Sometimes there's military training either in the evenings or in the mornings um, of work days, which is fine. Um, but Saturdays, as far as liberty goes, you have increased so as a fourth class, you have Saturday and Sunday until 1800, but no overnights. Um, I'm going to turn my camera off for a minute for Wi-Fi purposes, but um, no overnights. And then as time goes on, you get to the point as a first class, you have Thursday night liberty, Friday night liberty, and then you can go out on Saturday, stay overnight on Saturday, and then you don't have to be back on Sunday until 2200. Um, so it definitely like you get more time as time goes on and more privileges. Um, so I hope that answers the question about day-to-day -day life. Um, mm -hmm. the Thank you. Of... Oh. Go ahead. Sorry, I, we have a, they're sending them to you and to me, I think. I just wanted to answer a couple about the academy as far as getting in. I have, um, how much is Sea Cadets accounted for with being accepted to the Coast Guard Academy? And does it help your chances in any way? Absolutely. I mean, we're looking for a well-rounded applicant. So we're looking for students who have high academics, high test scores, have taken STEM courses in high school, and then they have leadership experience, which you are all either getting or on your way to getting through Sea Cadets. That's a great leadership program. And then we are looking at your athletic ability. Like uh, Ms. Roberta Latest said, you don't have to be a varsity athlete but you have to have some sort of athletic ability because you do need to stay physically uh, fit. And then you also need to participate in two out of three athletic sessions per year at the academy. Those can be club sports. Mr. Bertolatus is in uh, ice hockey. That counts even though it's not technically a varsity sport, it's a club varsity sport. So there's all different things that you can do, but that's what we're looking for. So sea cadets can definitely help you, but don't rely on that to be your only uh, program that you're involved in. We are looking for a well-rounded individual who has great things to bring to the Coast Guard Academy to enrich it, to enrich the community, but also ultimately to the Coast Guard. And then we had another question. 
how many people usually apply to the academy and how many are accepted. Usually around 2000 students ish um, apply to the academy and then we accept about 10% of them. So somewhere around 250 will come to the academy as brand new swabs. And then Mr. Bertolatus, if you could answer, what is your favorite part about living at the academy? So I think my favorite part about living specific, like when I'm specifically at the academy, my favorite part is being around my friends. Um, some of my close, like I had some decent friends in high school and some of my closest friends in the world are definitely here. They'll be friends for life. Um, like, uh, like the captain mentioned before, you definitely, you know, everybody in your class. And um, that's not to say that you're going to be close friends with everybody in your class, because that's not necessarily the case, but you will make some of the best friends that you'll ever have um, while you're at the Coast Guard Academy. Um, I got really lucky. One of my best friends from my, so after you, you finish your fourth class year, um, everybody goes to new companies. Um, one of my best friends from fourth class year uh, is still in my, my company. He went to my new company with me and we've been roommates um, pretty much every year since. And um, like, that's again, a friend for life. Um, and so that's, that's my favorite part. Um, I think outside of that, the best part of like academy life, in my opinion, is the summers. Um, the school year is, can be really, really hard. Um, there's no two ways about that. And I won't sugarcoat it, but the summers make it all worth it. Um, when I was a third class, um, so I had just finished my freshman year. I went for the first six weeks of the summer. I went and was at a small boat station in Chicago where I got to do, like I was a part of actual life-saving and property-saving rescues, um, which was an amazing feeling. And then the second half of my summer, I went on um, the Coast Guard Cutter Eagle, which for those of you guys that don't know, um, it, it's like a tall sailing ship. Um, it's awesome. Uh, we went to, um, we left from Puerto Rico, and then we went to Roatan, Honduras, Cartagena, Colombia, Curacao, um, and then pulled back into Miami. Um, and so, you know, while your friends are at home doing nothing over the summer from their break in college, or maybe they have, you know, a job working, um, you know, just a, just a menial job somewhere, um, we're out and like doing awesome things, traveling awesome places, helping people, serving the country. That's awesome. Um, past summer I spent like I said, the, the, the next summer after that is the cadre summer where you do a lot of training. Um, I was a cadre on the Coast Guard Cutter Eagle um, because swabs do spend one week on the cutter. Um, and also there's a program that generally runs for sea cadets to spend a week. It's an application-based program, but for sea cadets to spend a week um, underway with us on the Coast Guard Cutter Eagle, highly recommend you guys apply for that, if you're, especially if you're interested in applying to the Coast Guard Academy. Um, but that's what I did my second class summer. And then this past summer, I spent um, the first half on the Coast Guard Cutter Sturgeon Bay, which is a 140 foot ice breaking tugboat um, state, located in New York City. And my second half at the Aviation Logistics Center doing engineering work for um, the Aviation Logistics Center, sorry, in um, Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Um, and so that's, that's to me, that's the most awesome part is like getting to go out for the summers and do like the actual Coast Guard mission, um, be away from the books a little for a little while and be, be a little bit more in the, in the action, I guess, if you will. Um, a couple other questions that were sent to me. Um, somebody said, what do you think is the hardest part of getting ready for the Academy? Um, and I think that's like a really that's going to vary person to person. For some people, um, it might be getting ready physically, um, whereas other people may be in just fantastic shape. Um, for me, and I'm not necessarily saying this is the way to go, I'm happy that I did this. Um, once I found out I got into the academy and my school year had um, ended, so I was home, I had about... Um, between when I ended school and when I reported to the Coast Guard Academy, I had about a month and a half and I basically just, uh, I forgot about it. Like, I didn't worry about it. I enjoyed my time at home. I enjoyed my time with my family. Um, 
hung out with some friends, you know, worked out, stayed in shape, all of that good stuff. But um, once you're in, if that's what the question's referring to, for getting ready for the academy, um, I, I honestly recommend and just making most of the time you have still at home. And that's really, I mean, it's probably true regardless of where you choose to go to school, if you choose to go to school, and definitely if you choose to go to boot camp um, and list. Um, if you're talking about like pre-acceptance, um, the hardest part of getting ready for it. Um, I don't know, I wouldn't, the hardest part of getting ready before. I think it's trying to just like, it's stressful trying to um, think about like, what what do I need to do to get into the Coast Guard Academy? And I would say, um, honestly, don't, don't necessarily frame it like that. Just frame it in um, what do I want to do for my community? What do I want to do to make myself a better person? Um, and if you do those things, then honestly, I think you're, you're in a pretty good spot for getting into the academy potentially. Um, so I hope that answers the question. I, I know it's kind of a not very specific answer, but it's, it's what I really do think. Um, quick question here about does the Coast Guard have a football team? And if they do, um, do we compete with other branches of the armed forces or with other colleges? So um, the Coast Guard Academy does have a pretty full like selection of sports. It's that we play in uh, for varsity sports. Again, I'm a club athlete. Varsity sports play in D3 NCAA in what I believe is called the NUMAC Conference, which is the New England Women's and Men's Athletic Conference. Um, and it's, um, like I said, full sports, uh, basketball, men's and women's, uh, football, softball, baseball, um, rowing. Um, we do have a, both a dinghy and an offshore sailing program. I don't believe they're regulated through NCAA though. Um, in for the second half of that question, in general, um, we don't compete with the other service academies because um, Navy, West Point, and Air Force are all Division One. We do compete um, with the Merchant Marine Academy. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily call it competing because we usually clean them up pretty good, but um, we play sports against them. Uh, um, and then, you know, just other, we play regular schools too. MIT is in our conference. Um, uh, uh, Worcester Polytechnic, WPI, I believe is. Um, so yeah, but definitely plenty of sports uh, that, that I believe can also be found on the Coast Guard's admissions website or the Coast Guard Academy's admissions website, excuse me. Um, do you get paid to go to the Coast Guard? Academy? Um, the answer to that is yes. Um, we pay it's approximately $1,000 a month before taxes and anything else. Um, the caveat to that is that you also have to buy all your uniforms. Um, and that's the way that works is they initially basically give you everything and then you essentially have a loan um, to the Coast Guard that you have to pay off. And that loan is for about $10,000, which covers all of your uniforms, it covers your um, computer when you first get here, everything like that. So for the first two years, you see about um, 150 to $200 every two weeks. And then for the last year and a half that you're here, I'd say you probably see about $400 in pay every two weeks, um, which is less than a thousand, I know, but that that accounts for taxes and stuff. But yeah, as um, was just mentioned in the chat, yeah, I mean, you're, you're going to school um, for free. You pay for nothing, you don't pay for food, you don't pay for, you don't pay for um, your, your tuition. The only thing you pay for is textbooks. And honestly, most textbooks um, are, can be either found online in like a digital copy for pretty cheap or rented off of uh, a rental service like Amazon or Chegg or something like that, that rent out textbooks. Um, so that's not really too much of an expense. And that's definitely worth more than, than anything that we do get paid here. So somebody asked, do you find that the structure of the USCGA reduces common college misbehavior? Um, there definitely is less, like there is less, there's no doubt there's less of that. Um, within the academy. Um, 
the the truth is that for some people um you know they like to go out on liberty and do normal college misbehavior whatever um you know people will go out and and drink and um, go to bars things like that if you if that's what you're talking about by college misbehavior um but if you are not looking to to do that then you just don't do that and it's easily avoided it's not like there's um, frat parties or dorm parties or anything like that going on that, that does not exist um, if that's what that question was getting at um, so I hope that answers that and those, and those people are of age <laughs> yes yeah yes. just yeah to be clear about that yes um, and then there's somebody asked um, what is something you wish you knew before the academy and what advice would you give someone who is a junior looking to go to the academy um, something I wish I knew. Um, I'm trying to think back now because that's that's some time ago but I think the biggest thing that I wish I knew um, was that like I don't know you hear a lot about like how um, I think academies are held in kind of a different light from from other colleges and um I think the the reality is there's a, a lot more similarities than there are differences. Um, and having had both experiences, uh, there's there's not a right or wrong answer. Um, ROTC isn't inherently better than the than an academy. An academy is not inherently better than ROTC. At the end of the day, you're going to be commissioned as an ensign or a second lieutenant. Um, in in whichever way you choose to do that. Um, so I think that is something because I grew up kind of, I had always wanted to go to an academy. There was, like I said, originally I wanted to be a Marine officer, so it was Naval Academy. But, um, you know, you grow up thinking it's, it's really different. And honestly, I mean, at the end of the day, there's other stuff that we deal with. We do military training. We have to stay in shape. Uh, we don't get to leave whenever we want, like you do at a regular college. But I would say there's more similarities than there are differences. Um, and I, I guess the point that I'm getting at there is, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily, if you're worried about like getting a college experience or something like that, um, I wouldn't necessarily turn away from the Coast Guard Academy or any academy because of that. Um, our college experience is definitely different. No two ways about that, but it is still very much a college experience. Um, we know each other really well. We have a lot of fun with each other. Um, like I said, we get to do awesome things in the summer. Um, you will still get a college experience by coming to the Coast Guard Academy. Um, and advice, the, other, the second part of that question was what advice would you give someone who is a junior looking to go to the Academy? Uh, I think my biggest advice would just be to, to follow those things um, that, that are um, kind of prepare yourself with those things that I was talking about earlier, you know, get involved in stuff. Um, lead stuff, um, start getting in shape if you feel like you're not in shape or feel like you could be in better shape. Um, there's no like one piece of advice that's like the silver bullet that's good for everybody. Um, another piece of advice that I commonly give people, it's not so much for juniors looking to go, um, but for people who are actually currently writing their applications, which I guess would be juniors, starting, starting juniors, rising seniors. Um, is so like I think I'll never know because it's not like you get um you know your your application doesn't get returned marked up with red pen so you can see where you lost points or whatever else um so I'll never really know but my on paper I would say my application looked a lot better the first time around when I applied to the Coast Guard Academy I had a much higher GPA um like I was involved in a lot of things just from high school that aren't really a thing once you get out of high school, such as sea cadets. Um, and I didn't get in. And the second time I did get in with a college GPA in fairness, but a lower one, um, you know, and just not as, as much involvement. Um, I think a big part of it for me was my essays. Um, the first time around when I went and reread my essays, I wrote what I thought the Academy wanted to hear. Um, like one of the questions at the time, I don't know if it still is or not, but one of the questions is, you know, what's a, um, 
something you've worked towards, I think like a challenge or something you've worked towards. And uh, I, I kind of just like wrote about, yeah, again, like what I thought they wanted to hear. I wrote about being a chief in Sea Cadets and they already knew that about me. That was reflected in other parts of my application. So the second time I round, I wrote about how um, I, I, so I'm a big like Jeep fan. I love Jeep. And in high school, I got a job. Like, I, I decided I wanted a Jeep when I could start driving. So I got a job and I started working and I saved my money and I bought a Jeep and it wasn't running and I got it running. And like, that was my, that was my thing. And I wrote about it and it was a written essay, but it showed a different part of me. So I guess my, what I'm getting at there is if you're writing your essay or you're writing your application in general, don't just write like what you think they want to hear. Um, and ma'am, maybe you can comment on this, too, but I, I would definitely write something that you feel like is going to show who you are um, beyond paper. Like that's, that's a big piece of advice from me is don't just write what you think they want to hear, write about who you are, show them that. Definitely. Uh, so, so could you have this year, our application is a little bit different. If you happen to be a senior and you're still looking to apply, you still have plenty of time. Our deadline is January 29th. But um, we are looking for, like I said earlier, a well-rounded applicant who really does their best to give us their, their best foot forward on paper. And when you're writing your essays, we're looking for authentic, genuine people who want to be a part of the Coast Guard and who we would want to have in the wardroom and at the academy. So just be your authentic self, write from your heart and tell why you want to attend the Coast Guard Academy. Why do you want to be an officer in the Coast Guard and really present that in a professional manner uh, to us, your admissions officers, and then ultimately you're presenting to Captain Freedy. So what do you want him to know about you that's going to make him say, yes, I want to have that sea cadet or that applicant in my academy. Okay, so those are some things to, um, to think about. And then Captain, did you want to add to that? Yeah, great discussion with regards to the application. I think um, you guys hit the nail on the head. We want to see some variety. We want to see what makes you who you are. And uh, ultimately, we're selecting you for who you are. But we also know that we need you more than you need us because you got plenty of choices. So when you're talking about uh, what you know about the academy, why you chose the academic major that you took and how you see yourself fitting at the academy and in the service, we want to be able to understand that you know what you're stepping into. I know there's a lot of challenges out there. You haven't been able to come to the academy based off of COVID-19 or uh, you haven't been able to go out to the units and do the things that you typically would be able to do. But doing research on what it is that the Coast Guard is, what the Academy stands for, uh, what you know about the service and reflecting that in your application is really important in the grand scheme of things. And, uh, you know, finding out something unique about you is really important. There, there's no doubt about it. Uh, if you're going out to get letters of recommendation, we don't want to hear the same stuff over and over again. Get something unique from somebody that uh, you typically wouldn't get a letter of recommendation for, uh, for uh, like a coach. Coach will find out, will give us information on things that you have special skills in your personality out on the field. Uh, those are good letters of recommendation in addition to the required ones. So um, we want to know who you are. And then that helps us make that selection because we're trying to build an awesome team. <laughs> the next class that we're making is a class of 2025. We just started diving into the early action applications and we're doing pretty good in terms of reviewing them, but everybody's bringing something to the table. And uh, that's, that's incredible. It, it, what warms my heart is seeing who you guys are and what it is that you're doing day in and day out. Uh, I'm humbled every single time I open up a new application because I see the commitment to your academics, the commitment to your sports team, commitment to your musical talents, the commitment to your community. All that thing is true in the majority of the applications that we see. And uh, I really want to give you guys hats off because these are without question challenging times going through COVID-19. Uh, I know you're being uh, kind of kept in a box, but it's all for your safety when all is said and done. So maintain that positive attitude. And uh, definitely it's infectious because there might be some folks that are not really seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. If you remain positive and stay hopeful, 
then that's really where you're going to win when all is said and done. So I give you hats off because you're all smiling. That's a good thing. It shows that you're dedicated to the cause. You're looking sharp in uniform. And, and I'm very proud to be amongst all of you because you're the future of the United States. And uh, it's important that you understand that because we want to invest in you. We want to make sure that you understand there's opportunities out there. And if you're looking at the Coast Guard Academy, the only way you can be part of the conversation is if you apply. So we really hope that you do and hope that we can answer your questions in the future. But uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Just to clarify to some of you, I know in the Sea Cadet program, you get to see that as Sea Cadets, you're enlisted members, you, you use enlisted ranks and, and rates and such. Um, and then typically the adults are the only officers that you have a whole lot of interaction with. So I've had a couple of questions in the chat about working with a recruiter versus working with an admissions officer. So just to clarify, if you look at it like this, the enlisted workforce for the military in any branch is more along the lines of kind of like the teachers at a school, okay? They're hands-on getting in the classrooms, working directly with the students. The officers are more like the administrative staff at a school, okay? And those are the differences. If you wanna be a, an officer and be more of that higher level leadership role, although I will tell you in the Coast Guard, we employ our enlisted members with a great deal of leadership um, and give them a lot of responsibilities. When I was an enlisted, when I was a bosun's mate, third class, so only an E4, I was working toward getting my contingency coxswain, which meant I would be in charge of a whole crew plus an asset, a boat asset. And as an E4, I would have that responsibility. So we do put a lot of responsibility on our enlisted workforce. But as officers, you're getting even more responsibility and you can do like what Captain talked about earlier with his career, with being the CO of a ship potentially or a cutter, we call them in the Coast Guard, but being a CO and being only two years out of the academy, that's phenomenal. So that's kind of the difference. And if you're looking at going enlisted, which is great, you know, we need enlisted people. Um, if you're looking at that path, you're gonna be working with a recruiting office and you can find that at www.gocoastguard.com which i can post in the chat but that's different than admissions for the coast guard academy if you want to become an officer and you want to go through the academy get your undergraduate degree in one of the nine majors that captain talked about earlier then you want to apply to the academy and that's where you're you it depends on what classes you take in high school it depends on your leadership all of that matters on the enlistment side too you want to do well but, but we're really honing in on all those different characteristics uh, and skills that you bring to the table but it's a totally different path so i'm happy to answer any other questions um, if you want to send me another uh, any more private messages i just wanted to clarify the difference between the two and then i think we actually are um, about done with, with questions. I don't see any other ones. And in the interest of giving you guys your Sunday night, um, I think we are about ready to wrap it up. I'm gonna stay on and try to answer any of these questions that come in uh, as, we, as everybody starts to hang up. So if you sent a question, I'll try to make sure that I get them all answered before I sign off. But. Again, thank you so much, Captain Freedy. Appreciate your time, your expertise, your uh, background in the Coast Guard. And uh, First Class Bertolatus, thank you so much for telling us about your sea cadet uh, adventure and, and becoming a Coastie and becoming a cadet at the Academy. Appreciate all of that. And then Ms. Powell, thank you so much for helping us to set this up. We greatly appreciate you and the Sea Cadet Organization and this opportunity for uh, the admissions office and the Coast Guard overall. Thank you so much. And on behalf of the U.S. Naval Sea Cadet Corps, I just want to extend my gratitude to you, uh, Lieutenant Garfalo, and also Captain Freedy and First Class Bertolitis. Thank you so much for bringing the Coast Guard into our Sea Cadet family. And we look forward to this being a um, longer and closer relationship. To all of the cadets that joined, thank you so much for your interest in the Coast Guard and the Coast Guard Academy. And our guest speakers have said that they will stay on to answer any additional questions that didn't get answered. 
Um, this is a this is really a record for us. We this um, webinar lasted more than an hour and a half, and we have maintained almost our entire list of participants for the full hour and a half. Normally after an hour, uh, they drop off tremendously. So that just goes to show what a strong interest our sea cadets have in the Coast Guard and Coast Guard Academy. So thank you so much. Um, so uh, for those of you that are interested, please stay behind. And for the rest of you, thank you so much for your attention and time. And we look forward to um, seeing you again on one of our future webinars. We are planning on having another one in early December, more about uh, Coast Guard careers. Um, and so feel free to join us then and spread the word to other cadets in your units that didn't have a chance to join us tonight that we're going to be revisiting Coast Guard careers in early December. December 6, is that right, uh, Lieutenant? Yes, ma'am. That's the date that we have. Uh, I don't know that it's set 100% in stone, but I'm pretty sure that that is going to be it. Fantastic. So cadets, watch your um, emails for that information. And uh, thank you so much and have a good evening unless you plan on staying on to ask our guest speakers some more questions. Thank you so much. Ms. Powell, we have a question for you. Okay. It says, I see you are recording. Will this presentation be made available afterward? Yes, that is correct. So um, our, uh, all of our webinars are actually on Homeport. So you can go to Homeport and then go to COVID-19 up at the top in the menu, uh, COVID-19. And then from there, select the, the um, orange bubble that says webinars. And all the webinars that we've done, whether they're adult webinars or cadet webinars, are um, listed there on Homeport. So this one will be up uh, hopefully by the end of the week. Thank you, ma'am. So I have a couple of questions that came into, um, into me specifically as the host. I'm not sure if the rest of you have seen this. Um, somebody, somebody was asking, I don't know if they're still on, but I'll just throw this question out there anyway. It says, how much does a coach's input influence um, chance of an offer to a prospective student? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, with regards to our holistic review, uh, we look at academics, leadership potential, and then any special skill set that the individual brings to the table. Obviously that propensity to serve, that want to want to be a member of the Coast Guard, that's important as well. But uh, the athletic potential rating or musical potential rating, which are APR and MP, NPR, those are pretty important in terms of adding to the academy campus. How, how is that student gonna contribute uh, to the overall environment? So having a coach talk about, uh, let's say for instance, a swimmer, if a swimmer has the academic piece and the leadership piece, and then they're like the next Michael Phelps in the water, then that makes it pretty easy for us to make a determination of how they're going to contribute here at the academy. So it, it is an important piece, but uh, we leverage that based off of all the other activities that a student may take part in. Uh, not all schools are created equal, as we know, and they may not offer the same sports that we offer, but having an interest in an activity uh, is pretty important as well. So we'll review that and that's all part of our holistic review. But a, a coach can definitely add to the conversation. Uh, that's another advocate in the grand scheme of things. But I also wanna give uh, a shout out to our partners that are on there. I see uh, John Cavanaugh, it looks like Daniel Gonzalez are on there. So good to see you guys. They're just as important in the process because they're gonna do interviews for us. And for, we're trying to get 100% of the interviews done for this class of 2025, those that applicant pool and a good bulk of those are done by uh, our partners. We have about uh, 1,072 partners all across the United States and they spend countless hours in making sure that the Coast Guard Academy is represented at uh, many of our events that we're not able to attend or the ones that we are able to attend. So uh, they're very well packed patched into the system of admissions officers and they're able to speak on our behalf and they do an amazing job of finding talent that's out there. So 
Uh, to those partners that are out there, I specifically shouted out to John. Uh, Kay might be back there too, as well as Daniel. Uh, you guys are doing amazing work for us and add into the flavor of what we're trying to do is build uh, this academy to be as, as best as it possibly can. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. I did have someone asking about um, the Coast Guard Academy's sailing program. Excellent. So yes, so that's uh, actually uh, division one uh, out of the, the, the divisions that we have here, the majority of our sports programs are D3, but our sailing program is really at the top of the echelon. Understand we're a maritime service academy. Uh, we want to be top notch in that area. And so uh, we've had Olympic level uh, uh, athletes in, in the sailing program. We have one that was competing for this last Olympics, but based off of COVID, uh, the Olympics have been canceled, but we have an amazing waterfront. Uh, Jacob's Rock has, is host to amazing uh, Smith, uh, sailboats in, in a variety of different shapes and sizes. And uh, we are highly competitive in sailing. In, in fact, we're, we compete against the Naval Academy on a frequent basis and we do very well. So yes, sailing is, is tremendous. And there's a huge network in terms of the sailing alumni uh, they're a big part of adding to the discussion uh, when it comes down to what keeps this place strong. Uh, we're uh, building a, a major uh, uh, building on the, on the waterfront. It's called our Maritime Center for Excellence. That will be the newest building that's being constructed. And that's all focused on introducing students to sailing. That's going to be a repair facility in addition to a presentation area and then some office space. It's going to replace our current Pine Hall. So we're excited for that. And that's going to be mostly alumni funded. So uh, sailing is very important to us. And uh, hopefully as the students are here, uh, they get that appreciation for the liking for the sea and the floor. Uh, our first class said that he got the ultimate experience on Eagle. So hats off to him for being cadre out there and loving that experience. But that's, that's a pretty remarkable opportunity to get out there uh, on Eagle and see that for himself. And, um, you know, your uh, coastal sail experience, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so during the cadre summer, um, again, like I mentioned, most of it is training or a big part of it is training the the fourth class, but the coastal sail that the captain's talking about is another program that takes place during the cadre summer. And basically what it is, is um, there's a, a series of 44 foot sailboats um, that are owned by the Coast Guard Academy. I believe also alumni funded mostly. Um, and it's a two week long program and you spend the first two days, it's, it's you and between six and eight other cadets and you spend the first two days kind of just going out into the Thames River and the Long Island Sound and learning how to sail a little bit. And then after that, you leave on the third day and you you go for the, the remainder of the two weeks. So we sailed from here to Stonington and pulled into places like uh, Hyannis and Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. Uh, we were scheduled to pull into Block Island, but hit a major storm that did some serious damage to some of our boats. So we, we didn't end up going there, but... Um, just an awesome experience and also a lot of in addition to just being a great time you're going out and you're pulling into these these awesome ports every night it's also a great leadership experience because the safety officer the the majority of them so there's one commissioned safety officer that's on board each boat uh, but for the majority of the time unless there's an actual safety issue involved they just kind of be quiet and sit in a corner and there's a cadet designated every day as the uh, watch captain who basically it's their job to oversee everything that goes on on the boat and make sure that you get from point A to point B safely, um, ideally, ideally quickly, um, and um, oversee, yeah, everybody else on the boat. There's a navigator, there's sail trimmers, you have a helmsman who's actually physically steering the boat. Um, but that was a great program. That was, aside from the cadre part of it, um, that was probably the highlight of my summer. It's, it's a fantastic program. You really get to know your classmates well. Um, because you're, you're spending uh, like 10 days within 44 feet of all of them or all eight of them. So you get to know the people on the boat really well. Uh, you go out to some nice dinners when you pull into the ports every night and just kind of hang out and relax. And it's, it's a great time. Yeah. 
Thanks for that explanation. It's it's like the closest thing that you'll get to the lotting, yachting lifestyle. Uh, people pay big money for that, and it's part of the program. So uh, it's really exciting to see that. Uh, Swab Summer, you get a lot of uh, the smaller boat uh, experience, you know, the single person, two person sailboat uh, fundamentals, and then you work your way up to the 44 footer. So I uh, appreciate your explanation on that. That was a highlight of my uh, time at the Academy. It, we called it looters back then. Same type of thing. You, you just got to go out there and do amazing things and learn about sail. Pretty cool. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so one last chance for anyone that's still on to ask their question for our guests. I don't want to tie them up too much. They've already given us almost two hours of their time. So if you do have one last question to send to either Captain Freedy or uh, First Class Bertolitis or Lieutenant uh, Garfalo, please go ahead and post that question now. And we'll get to as many as we can in the next 10 minutes. And I did post my email address on the chat as well, and they are welcome to email me any questions that they have. Great. I had one question uh, with regards to what age do you have to be to join the Academy? So age is 17 on day one, uh, but you can't be older than 23 on day one. So um, that there's the age range, 17 to uh 22 you can't be 23 on day one is that right laura yes sir but you All can right. turn you can turn 23 the day after you report okay that's right yep so you have to be 22 on day one and then uh 23 could be a couple of days after so thank you good question I would, I would say who wrote that, but I can't read it. It's uh, D-M-D-V-E-R-D-E-V-L-E-D. -E -E He's an E2. Thank you for that question. Uh, Captain or Lieutenant, I got a question privately here. For the admittance of the Academy, is it always 10% to get in? I figure that's a better question for you all than me. Excellent question. So uh, I put out there typically 10 to 18% given a year the class sizes change and application pools change as well in terms of numbers so good range would be 10 percent to 18 percent selection rate uh, we typically appoint more than folks accept because as i said before we need you more than you need us so people have choices so we put out about 418 app or uh, appointments last year to get a class of 265. we targeted 265 on day one we had exactly 265 uh, students report in. So that was pretty good. But uh, 10 to 18% selection rate. And that's true for all the service academies when you look at the candidate pools, uh, that range. Great question. I could too. I have another question that I just got. It was how hard are the classes at the academy? Um, and my opinion on that is that basically the classes themselves, I would, I would argue, um, are pretty similar to what you would find at another top level program in whatever major it is that you're in. So if it's um, an engineering program, another top level engineering school, or if you're in government, you know, maybe, I don't really know, because I'm not in government, but a top level um, government program, like an Ivy League or something like that. Um, I think what really um, sets the academy apart in terms of like difficulty and time constraints on that is the other stuff that you have to manage in addition to those classes um so for one there's more classes because you also have to take like navigation classes and things like that so you're just going to take at other at other colleges where you might take 12 to at most 16 credits i'd say the academy 16 is like the bare minimum that you can expect to take and more realistically you'd probably in the, be in the 18 to 19 credit hour range um and then you have to get your uniform ready every night and you have to keep your room straight and um, you know do whatever you have to do to stay in shape and things like that. Um, the follow-up question I got to that was how are the student-teacher relationships? And I think they're great. Um, having been to a, a regular college, um, still, uh, I mean, the, the school I went to was a, a good, well-rated school, um, but I was in classes and lecture halls of I don't know, maybe 300 people sometimes. Um, 
and I rarely talked to my teachers, maybe a TA, but rarely talked to my teachers. And if I did, they certainly didn't really know who I was. Um, here, I think the biggest class that I've been in was, um, I think it was like 60 people. And that was one class that they were trying something new with. Um, aside from that, the biggest class I've been in was about 25. Um, and so every teacher, once you're in their class, they know who you are, if not before that. Um, every teacher in my academic department, I know them all, they know me, even if I haven't personally had them in class. Um, they all, like, there's no such thing really as office hours at the academy, like there is at other schools, because every time that a teacher's in their office that they're not teaching a class is office hours. Like, you can just walk in and again, if they're not with another student or walking into the classroom to teach a class in five minutes, like they will set aside what they're doing and they'll, you know, pull their chair around to the whiteboard and start writing equations down or whatever the case may be with you. Um, they're super committed to, to teaching and, and, and they want you to succeed. They want you to graduate. I think that's another um, misconception about the academy is that like, it's about like, oh, let's weed people out. Like if they don't belong here, we're going to get rid of them. Like we're going to weed them out. Um, it's it's uh, maybe historically at one point it was, I don't really know. I personally don't at all feel like the culture of the academy now is about weeding people out. It's 110% um, like about trying to get everybody through. Everybody wants you to succeed, even when you're a fourth class and like it feels like people are yelling at you and, um, you know, maybe you're questioning why you're here. They want you to know that you can be here and do belong here and want you to succeed. Um, and I, I can't emphasize that enough, but especially, you know, in the academic realm, the teachers are, are there for you a hundred percent. So. I, I got a question from uh, Connor Fitzmorris. Uh, he asked, what is it like after graduating in the service? And I sent him a pretty long answer, but I think uh, everybody's going to have a different experience depending on what your desires are, what your path is, what you go to for your first tour at, after the academy. I think after the academy, one of the things that you get to learn how to do is uh, fill your own refrigerator and cook your own meals. That's kind of cool. You get to choose where you want to live uh, and figure out how to do the daily the ins and outs of, of navigating your life as this new newly minted ensign that has a, a bright future ahead of you. So uh, yeah, you'll have a time when you have to show up for work. You'll have a time when you're gonna be underway. Uh, you're gonna have a time when you're gonna be called into duty and everything outside of that is up to you. So that's kind of neat. At the Academy, it's a pretty regimented lifestyle. Uh, you get every minute kind of managed for you and then you're out on your own and you're like, wait a second, I'm a grown adult that has a commission. I can fill my refrigerator with ice cream if I choose, but hopefully you don't do that, but the choices are really up to you. Uh, one of the things that I did share with Connor was that uh, within the first 10 years of me serving in the, in the Coast Guard, I had visited 36 countries. I had served in the Arctic. I had served in the jungles of South America and over in the Raving Gulf. So understanding the law enforcement background that I formed on my ship was able to open many doors and just build upon that. Uh, it's pretty awesome that your opportunities in the Coast Guard are boundless. If you want to go back afloat after your first tour, you can do that. If you choose not to do that, you wanna to go to flight, you can do that. It's to choose your own adventure book. You, you figure out what, what it is that makes your heart pump and then you can figure that out. If you wanna work for admissions, please, we want you. But uh, at the end of the day, there's so many things that you can do in your career and the Coast Guard just offers that. They're just like, here's more leadership opportunities. Here's another great opportunity for you. Go do it. And they trust you after the four years at the Academy, uh, all that time and effort that you put in to get into that point of being an officer, officer, the Coast Guard's expecting you to do what they taught you and they leave it up to you. And so that's what's pretty cool about the Coast Guard. There's, there's very little... Uh, adult supervision <laughs> outside of the typical uh, day in and day out that you would be at a unit. But for the most part, they're expecting you to lead. They're expecting you to be part of that team. They're expecting you to contribute and have impact. Like Laura, 
I could send her over the horizon to a foreign country to do whatever it is that she needs to do. And I can trust she's going to get it done because she's demonstrated that ability to get the job done. I have no worries with that. So, and she's a Lieutenant Junior Gray. She's worked hard to get to that point. Guess what? Salute sharply. I'll send her out to do whatever it is that the Coast Guard needs to do. And I know it's going to get done. And I know every single ensign that's prepared by the Academy or goes through OCS will be prepared to do the same thing. And uh, that, that's what's awesome about the service. We give a lot of responsibility to the folks that we have served in that service. And that's true for the enlisted ranks too. Uh, they do the mission every single day without adult supervision. So one of the most dangerous things that we do is give uh, a petty officer or even an ensign a sidearm to go out to do the law enforcement mission. You know, that's pretty dangerous when all is said and done, but we trust them to do it. And then we're not there. We don't have webcams. We don't have those types of things to, to make sure that they're doing what they should be doing. We trust that they do what they're supposed to be doing if they get the training and they will get the training before they do the mission. And so that's what's awesome about the Coast Guard. Sorry, I get excited about that as I think back way back when, like 30 years ago when I was new and, it was all excited. and I still am excited because I think about that. It makes my heart pump. It's awesome. So that's what you have to look forward to. And it's worth every single piece of sacrifice that you put into your daily experience at the Academy. Uh, it's all worth it when all is said and done. Thank you so much, Captain. Your enthusiasm for the Coast Guard is definitely infectious. And I understand why the Coast Guard selected you to be director of admissions at the Coast Guard Academy because you have such a deep love for your service. Um, so thank you so much. We're coming up on two hours now. If you all have any unanswered questions, please email them to Lieutenant uh, Garfalo. Her email address is in the chat. And um, if I could just ask our guest speakers to stay on just a, another minute. And for our participants, you know, thank you again for your interest and uh, look for an announcement for another Coast Guard webinar in December. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Vicki.